that way you're addressing the problem. Whereas if you just send parents off to sort it themselves out and stop with the high conflict, then the problem that you have is that as soon as the court's not watching again, the arrangements break down, um, the abuse continues to such an extent that it's, it is a kind of mental torture. Hello and welcome to this vlog for the Survivor Diaries. This is a vlog so it is more behind the scenes and this one in particular, I'm not even going to do the normal disclaimers, um, something that I, some things that I am particularly passionate about uh, and I feel that I need to make a vlog about are uh, current in the news today. And so I will be covering within this vlog the domestic abuse bill and also the um, survivors and the voices of survivors being heard, in particular the hashtag the court said campaign um, which is run by Natalie and I'm going to talk about those two things and what I'm concerned about. It did occur to me that maybe people don't know what the domestic abuse bill is so I am going to just quickly in this vlog which I'm also hoping is going to be a very quick blog, vlog, I'm just going to cover what the bill is um, what the bill is intended to do and the first thing that I'm going to be covering which is my concern about the importance of this bill and how it's how it's going to fare in the prorogation of the Parliament um, which is something that is extremely topical today. So the bill, just for people who aren't aware, a bill is a, a proposed act of Parliament, a proposed new law and it's written as a bill and then it's discussed in Parliament, cutting it very, very just quickly what happens. It's discussed in Parliament and then it reaches royal assent and it's made into a law. And the domestic abuse bill um, was originally announced in, I think it was late 2016, 2017. And that is when the consultations began and the voices of survivors was being very much heard and listened to. Um, a lot of professionals that were working with domestic abuse and this is in response to society's current feeling about domestic abuse which is growing more and more intolerant about it. Society is evolving and many men that I speak to are keeping up with that. A lot of non-abusive men, I don't, I don't think all men are abusive, a lot of non-abusive men that I have in my life can see that domestic abuse is this thing that carries on from the patriarchal society and it's something that needs to be eradicated basically because it treats people as though they are not equal and I come from a perspective of all people being equal regardless of sex, religion, um, any of the other things and therefore I expect to be treated as an equal and I expect to treat people as an equal and so there's no place really for domestic abuse as it is as a, as a function of a patriarchal society in my mind. So the domestic abuse bill is a current um, topic it's called Theresa, Theresa May's flagship, um, which is reflective probably of the amount of work that has been put into this piece of legislation. The legislation has already experienced quite a lot of delays coming into force, so the bill has been delayed quite a bit um, for, for various reasons. And there's a current fear or worry that the prorogation of Parliament would cause further delay. I'm not sure whether that would be the case or not, but something that is coming up as a worry is the fact that the, there seems to be no certainty at the time of making this vlog that the domestic abuse bill is going to be discussed and seen as an item for Parliament as a matter of urgency following the prerogation, the suspension of Parliament that's going to happen. And there's no certainty coming from the government that that is something that is going to be in place and being discussed and being brought into law as quickly as possible. Boris Johnson is talking about fresh domestic legislation and this has caused a lot of people to fear that the hard work going into this bill could now just be dropped or thrown out and this is something that I feel very strongly about. I've consulted on the domestic abuse bill consultation and that consultation was way back in March to, um, 2018, 20th of March in London and I, 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 I've seen it happening, I've seen the voices of survivors being listened to and being fed back so things like um, greater awareness, 
increasing awareness in society, the education of NHS professionals, doctors, nurses, teachers, people who can spot the signs of the more subtle forms of domestic abuse and that would include domestic abuse continuing through the child arrangements which presents a lot of parents with this horror of having to face their abusive personality and the courts not taking the abuse seriously. So this leads this this bill would in itself lead to further training in my mind. I'm going to come back to what the bill would do in a second. And that's why it feels I feel very uneasy about the lack of certainty about this bill going forward. Um, and this is at the time of recording this on the 1st of September. I hope that some certainty will come forward very, very soon about the domestic abuse bill. The bill itself, what will it do? Well, I refer to the Home Office guidance. Um, it, it will create, for example, these are some of the main highlights, it will create a new legal definition of domestic abuse which will include economic abuse, um, something that's been very difficult to identify and greater training, greater awareness of this. This is, in my mind, exactly what needs to happen, not just in people who are working with domestic abuse but in society as a whole and that's because domestic abuse is a problem of society and the quicker that the society becomes intolerant of domestic abuse the quicker we will change domestic abuse. One thing, that, Another thing that the Domestic Abuse Act would do if it became an act it would establish a domestic abuse commissioner to protect survivors and victims of domestic abuse. It would also introduce new domestic abuse protection notices and orders. Um, it would prohibit the cross-examination of victims by abusers in the family court and it would c create an automatic eligibility for things like special measures in court which is the use of separate waiting rooms, screens, um, different entrances and exits and things that allow people to participate in the hearings even though they are actually being brought into a room together with somebody who has abused them and created a mental torture for them, if not a physical torture for them throughout th their experience, th together throughout their relationship. And having to be brought back into those proceedings, again, is I hope something that I've shown from my own vlogs, family solicitor or no, dealing with my own ex-abuser in family court is absolutely terrifying. And I'm saying that as a family lawyer who assists people with this on a daily basis. One of the things, and this is not in the, um, one, of, one of the more obvious things, but I've also already referred to the fact that it is an aim of the government and the Home Office. If you look at the Home Office Domestic Abuse Bill 2019 fact sheets, and we'll put a link to that below this video, a key aim of the legislation is to raise awareness and understanding of the devasta devastating sorry, impact of domestic abuse on victims and their families. And that is one of the key aims running through the legislation. I've already said that raising awareness, we have a greater awareness of the subtle forms of domestic abuse in society and the devastating effects that that can have. This would give a greater understanding of the problem and therefore more support would be available to people experiencing the problem. So if schools were receiving training, if doctors were receiving training, nurses were receiving training, then they would be more alive to the more subtle forms of abuse, be able to discuss openly with the person their situation and if it is acceptable to them and if it is something that they need help removing themselves from. This would increase the intolerance of domestic abuse in the society which is the thing that is going to eliminate domestic abuse as we go forward. That is how we have to eliminate it because everybody in society has to be saying no it's just not acceptable and that way we are making people have to change their behaviour. Um, that There are ways that an abusive personality can change their behaviour, they, they need to attend on a domestic abuse perpetrator programme. There's a lot of work that is done through those programmes and a person who is genuinely engaging with it can genuinely change their behaviour. And I think that this is how domestic abuse would be squeezed out, eradicated from society as we go forward. It's also something that I keep coming back to in both the vlogs and the episodes, which is about the inconsistent application of the practice direction. And the fact that I sometimes think that the the family courts do not give allegations of domestic abuse the 
significance and the weighting that they need to do. And I think that the, the recent changes to the practice direction at the end of 2017 mean that the court now have a greater duty. They must look at allegations of domestic abuse. And it's not possible for judges to say, without looking at that evidence, that it's not a harmful situation and that the two parents need their heads knocking together or they need to just go away from this hearing and you know come back to the next hearing having worked out how the contact is going to happen. It's not okay for the courts to dismiss things as historic. Uh, granted, if they've already looked at those specific allegations, if, even if they have, there could be more recent things that are happening, and particularly in my area and what I'm focused on in these episodes, which is how the domestic abuse continues through the child arrangements, there may be further evidence of harm being caused to the children since the last time it was heard in court, and surely that is something that needs to be looked at again. This is why, in my mind, why it's so important to listen to people who have experienced domestic abuse and listen to people who have experienced the family court system to see and improve on the things that were getting wrong in the family justice system. And this is where domestic abuse has been downplayed by the abuser to such an extent that the court has also seen, well, he's alleging abuse as well and she's alleging abuse. Just go sort it out. And I think... In that case, that's the opposite of what should happen. If they're both alleging abuse, then there definitely needs to be a fact-finding hearing to determine the allegations of domestic abuse in accordance with the, the practice direction. Survivors and their experiences through the court process are what we can use to ensure a consistency of good practice because there is good practice that happens in the family courts as well. My own cases are examples of good practice in that, and these are my own personal cases, my own talk as a court user, because it, it comes down to evidence. It comes down to evidence and fact finding or findings made as part of a final order. And there's, there's a separate episode that I'm going to do about evidence and how to show if somebody is providing false evidence. And as you will see, it comes down to evidence and the, the fact that allegations of domestic abuse they, they can't be made up, so there's either evidence supporting it or there isn't evidence supporting it. Um, people can't make false allegations, people can't say that they're falsely alienated if it goes to, into this checking mechanism. And the checking mechanism is where domestic abuse can correctly be picked up by the court and, that prov and then something can be done about it, a domestic abuse perpetrator programme, etc. And that way you're addressing the problem, whereas if you just send parents off to sort it themselves out and stop with the high conflict, then the problem that you have is that as soon as the court's not watching again, the arrangements break down, um, the abuse continues to such an extent that it's, it is a kind of mental torture to people having to try to co-parent with an abusive personality. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's all about control. It's all about mental health and like undermining of their mental health. So the, that's leading me into the other thing that I wanted to talk to, about in this episode, which is listening to the voices of survivors. And there is a campaign at the moment, which is hashtag the court said, um, that's on social media. And there are a lot of very harrowing accounts of things that have happened, what people have experienced in the family court system. And the thing that I keep coming back to is to say that we need to use those to make sure that these things don't happen again and therefore the voices of survivors do need to be heard. The voices of survivors have been heard in creating the Domestic Abuse Bill, in shaping the Domestic Abuse Bill, and both of these things are what's needed to tackle the problem in society. Again, just going back, this is something that I do feel very strongly about. Um, the Domestic Abuse Bill, if you weren't aware of the Domestic Abuse Bill, I'm hoping that you can now have a better idea of where that is and why it's important because in my mind it is increasing training, it's increasing awareness and therefore it's dealing with the problem and it will squeeze it out of society quicker if we can get this bill through now that in its final stages of preparation as quickly as possible and I wouldn't like anything else to delay that any further. If you can also support hashtag the court said and that campaign you'll add if you haven't already add your voices to hashtag the court said um, there are other things that I'm aware that people are doing today 
And so if you see that and if you can say why it is that you stand with survivors of domestic abuse um, and put a short video of that, then please do so. Myself personally, I am a family lawyer in England and Wales and I am also a survivor of domestic abuse and I am a recent court user. I do believe that the court system, the family justice system can work. There is a mechanism in place that deals with domestic abuse, deals with it in the child arrangements and that needs to be consistently applied by the court. I hope that I'm managing to get this message through and if you're watching this vlog you will help me to share this message about the practice direction and the consistent application of the practice direction and listen to the experiences of people where it has not been followed consistently. I, thought, I hope that that's been informative and useful as always and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode for the Survivor Diaries. Thank you for watching and goodbye.